Post Game Show, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook. Download the app today and use promo code CHGO when you sign up. Welcome in to Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Alongside me is the full CHGO White Sox crew. You got Vinny Duber, our CHGO White Sox beat writer. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. And that is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him on Twitter at Actorwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. We are coming to you live from our West Loop office or studios offices they're both of those things there you go uh in downtown chicago after a white Sox winner 4-2 against the cleveland guardians this series is knotted up at one dylan cease had a pretty good start logan allen had a pretty good start that got a little bit messy uh but the big news is always seemingly with the white Sox injuries uh joe kelly uh looked like he tweaked his back but he was able to finish the eighth inning so Good news there, but Luis Robert left the game. He did. It was late. Uh, it was almost uh, completely missed. You know, these two uh, Sox Guardians games have been going at warp speed, which is, again, second night in a row. You can see the skyline out behind us out the window because the sun is still out, even though the White Sox have just completed a night game. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, the I don't even remember what inning it was. It must have been the eighth inning there. Uh, Josh Naylor uh was the mm-hmm. batter that ended the yes, inning. Yes, yes. Jose Ramirez was on third base because Ramirez tripled off the wall uh, out of the reach of a leaping Clint Frazier. That ball rolled back to the middle of the outfield. Luis Robert Jr. went to go pick it up. He slipped a little bit. We'll see if that was the instigating incident here, but they call it left hip tightness uh, and that uh, Luis is day-to-day. Yeah, I don't want to see that because the man was hitting well today. Um out of any of the hitters earlier in the game, him and Romy were actually seeing Logan Allen a little bit better. I mean, Luis got robbed in the first inning and then got two hits off of Logan Allen before he uh, departed. So uh, we know that Luis is our best hitter, and he has been consistently hitting as uh, as of late. And so anything of him missing any time will be very, very sad. We just talked about that yesterday. Son of a bitch. I think I jinxed it, Sean. I, I, you always say that you jinxed it, and I don't. I mean, you just have bad ne- energy with injuries, so like maybe just change the energy. Maybe just be a better vibe. Or and also, maybe, maybe nothing you say has anything to do with what's going on in Cleveland, Ohio. I maybe. <laughs> I'm gonna try my bad thing. I've never won the lotto. Please, never, ever. Do you buy lotto tickets? Not really. Okay, well then, I mean, how do you, how do you win if you can't can't enter? Somebody's gonna lotto. Might as well be me. Right, I mean, you, you miss one hundred percent of the shots you don't take, Herb. If yeah. you do, uh, as uh, West Loop Tom, who doesn't know we're in the West Loop, uh, always shares. It's that uh, like it's the fake gambling self help uh, pamphlet, and it's like when the gambling stops, become fun, and bet more. Um, where you know, because you're always just one day away from hitting it big. Uh, anyways, uh, tough news for Luis Robert Jr. Hopefully, it's nothing big day to day. Um, maybe even with the day game, it was possible that he'd probably be getting a day off. I'm not sure. Um, so hopefully this could just be a, a blip in the radar. He has played a decent amount of games so far this year. Uh, I think he's only missed one game, uh, sat out for, for one game so far. So uh, a break might be scheduled uh, for him. So hopefully uh, that is just day-to-day. Um, and if there's more updates from Cleveland, uh, from Pedro Grafal on Ro- Robert, we will let you know. Uh, what sticks out the most from today's game. Do you want to start with Dylan Cease? Do you want to start with the offense that took a very long while to wake up? It, It's the offense. And, yes, the output in the seventh inning, awesome. Need to see that. Aided by a couple of Indian or it, Whoa. Guardian. Whoa. Put a dollar in the swear jar there, like Herb. $20 in the swear <laughs> jar. It's been Guardians for like two years now. <laughs> Guardian airs there. And so. You didn't do it yesterday at all either. I didn't. I we did a pregame and a postgame. I haven't done it this whole, seri- yeah. this whole series. And then I do it again. I was talking about uh, Clint Frazier. And so I did the Guardian slash Indian thing. So it probably popped in my head. But the lackluster at bats they had versus Logan Allen a guy that they have seen recently, last Thursday, and they just couldn't see him until the seventh inning where they got a couple of good at-bats, and I thought that Terry Francona and Carl Willis, the pitching coach, left him in there way too long. It looked like he was, yes, he was aided by a couple bad errors, but it's the seventh inning already. You should have somebody in from that nice uh, shutdown bullpen, Karen Check, Stefan, one of those guys could have came in in that inning and I think would have you know, held the White Sox to the two runs that they got, but... No, it's uh, he let him hit, and uh, Romy made him pay. 
So I think the offense needs better at bats in the beginning of the game. We saw our my guy Jake Berger five strikeouts, not good, not good at all. The top of the lineup, while Timmy I think got a hit, and he looked good in the in the outfield. I mean in the infield with that great play to get Josh Bell. I don't know where you were going at home. Those two guys at the top of the order, like it has been with him and Benintendi, we, a little less Benintendi because he extended his uh, hitting streak to 10 games today. Ew. This has been a problem with the White Sox constantly. And Logan Allen had no troubles going through this White Sox order quickly and efficiently. And then the only people, like I said, Luis Robert and Romy Gonzalez are really the only ones that I saw like, all right, they're giving quality at bats and they're doing something against this guy who's only throwing 90, but the White Sox for the second time in a row couldn't see him until the seventh inning. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think I would bring up the idea that it's like, hey, the offense got there eventually. You know what I mean? Not how you start, how you finish kind of thing. Uh, You're right in saying that this is a lineup that should fare better against the pitcher of that caliber. That being said, they got the hits they needed to get. They scored the runs they needed to get. They took advantage of Jose Ramirez making that, you know, mistake, big, big (laughs) mistake there in the seventh inning. Um, You know, Benintendi, give him credit for coming up with that huge double there Mm -hmm. ahead of that Ramirez error. Uh, And then obviously what Romy Gonzalez was able to do with his double later in the inning. Uh, But then in that same inning, they make the pitching change that you said came too late. And what happens? With runners on second and third, nobody out, strikeout, strikeout, strikeout. So Mm -hmm. they're fortunate then that this didn't get further out of hand. Obviously, the uh, White Sox bullpen has been phenomenal lately. They were very good again tonight uh, with the exception of just that one hit I believe or that triple that was the only hit Graveman walked a guy uh, to lead off the ninth inning but that was kind of immediately done away with um, thanks to a double play uh, Jimenez singled in the ninth after the double play yeah after the double play. okay so so but but again the bullpen made it sure that not cashing in those two runs didn't matter right mm-hmm. uh, at the uh, at the end of the day they scored four runs they won the game uh, this is a Cleveland team that the White Sox have shown uh, both last week and this week you don't need a ton of runs nope. to to beat them. Uh, take the go ahead and take the four four two win. They did the same thing against the Royals too, with only allowing I think it was four runs in that entire series. Mm-hmm. So um, if the pitching is doing its job, the offense's job becomes easier. Yes, uh, and 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 you don't need to have a day where you knock a guy around for eight runs, even if even though it might look like a matchup in which that can happen. So I think you're right. They they. Should have they could have been a lot better. There was a lot to clean up today, but at the end of the day, the offense did come through when it needed to come through. Well, and that's the thing. All, all you need to do is win. Uh, Zachary sharing in the the chat. Uh, I just saw the f- the second one first, saying, "I know it's insane considering they're ten games under five hundred. Sox improved to twenty and thirty, uh, but he also said, uh, if the Twins lose, they're only five and a half games out." <laughs> first place, which is absolutely what ridiculous. I, what I've been telling uh, you in the last few days, there's they might they might have a horrible record, but there is reason to watch this team because they are right in the right in the middle of this division race. Twins are up to nothing right now in the middle of the fifth. Um, I heard a stat that made me want to throw up. Uh, I think the AL East right now, like if you just took their winning percentage, like that team would have ninety nine wins. So like the AL East. As an average, okay. for 162 gotcha. games, gotcha. that average team would win 99 games. The AL East. The AL East. The aver- what about the uh, AL Central? I don't know. Bad. And I don't want to know. The worst <laughs> team in the AL East would be uh, tied for the top team in the AL Central, which is the Toronto Blue Jays at 25 and 23. Same record would be the Twins. That doesn't sound that impressive. That one I'm not that impressed by. I mean, they're the worst I mean, team, and they've lost five in a row. They had to get colder than... Hell to get older than Canada. Yeah, to get to <laughs> where the Twins are, and they're probably up in, t- in Toronto. They're like, "Hey, fire John, whatever his name is, fire everybody." I know KPW's in the chat right now. He's not happy at all. Well, yeah, what I think well, NBC Sports during the broadcast tonight showed a stat that was each division's winning percentage outside of their division, and the AL Central was last. I believe it was three. Th- 33 or something like that. Sounds like, they're right. just winning one out of every three games. Like, it was the, it was not pretty. The AL East, I think, is just like 63%. It was way up yeah, there. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Um, let's go to a, a stat graph we put together. Um, it, it's the second time they've seen Logan Allen. This is the seventh pitcher that the White Sox have seen twice this year, which over 50 games feels pretty tight. Uh, can we go to the list of pitchers first, uh, Stephen, just so people can get a real reference of 
who the Sox have seen. Uh, they saw Zach Granke on the uh, 8th of May and the 19th of May. They saw Jordan Lyles on the 9th of May and the 20th of May. They saw Zach Eflin on April 23rd and April 28th. They saw Pablo Lopez on April 11th and May 4th. They saw Calvin Fauché uh, on April 21st and April 29th. He was more of an opener, but still, you know, uh, they, they probably had the same game plan. Uh, they saw Shane McClanahan on April 22nd and April 27th, just five days later. And Logan Allen, same thing, five days later on uh, May 18th and May 23rd. The first time they see these starters, over 41 innings, uh, 33 hits, six er- 16 earned runs, uh, five home runs hit, four walks, 40 Ks. Uh, that's mostly Shane McClanahan uh, and a called <laughs> strike with percentage of 30.3%. We always share around like 28 to 29% is average for a major league starter. So the White Sox, you know, help or at least are, uh, you know, an, an easy opponent uh, for a, a, a starting pitcher for the first time. And then the second time, 35 innings pitched, 34 hits allowed. So one more hit. Uh, the second time around, uh, one more earned run in six less innings, same amount of home runs, five home runs, more walks, 11 compared to five, uh, less strikeouts, 32 compared to 40, and uh, less times getting called strikes and whiffs. So uh, 27.4%. So, you know, I, I do think that there are some outliers. Like Shane McClanahan was dominant in both starts, right? Uh, Shane McClanahan was He's quite good. Very good. Yeah. He was record setting the first time against them, and then he was like, you know, good to great. Uh, the second time around. But, like, you know, Jordan Lyles had a pretty easy second outing against them. I mean, even Logan Allen, we talk about it. Like, it, it does feel like they had one good inning against these guys. But, again, like, it was a, a long road to get to the breaking point of Logan Allen today. What I saw there is uh, the second time around, they struck out less and they walked a ton more versus those pitchers. So, if I'm going to take any positives out of that is that they're – a little bit more patient when they see a second uh, guy a second time around. And maybe the third time around in the batting order today versus Logan Allen is what did the trick versus the White Sox. As I said before, um, this is a very rare criticism of Tito Francona, not, especially not him going to the, bull, the, to the mound every five seconds, but he leaving Logan Allen out there to get hit like he did. Uh, I thought he could have been taken out, as Vinny pointed out. The guy in El De Los Santos immediately struck out the three White Sox that came out of there. So it looked like Logan was running out of gas, even though he had way under 100 pitches because the White Sox did not make him work at all early in the game. So, yeah, it's a good thing that they, you know, see a little bit better, but those numbers weren't, like, drastically better. It's, it's good that they strike out less fewer times versus the same pitcher because they have the game plan of the guy. But today, it just it didn't seem say, uh, satisfactory. The the Yaz home run, mercy. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Out of the zone, just going to get 91 up top. That's great. But other than that, it was very uh, few and far between. I thought we're going to have a repeat of what yesterday was where – Hunter Gaddis is shutting down the White Sox, and then you scored no runs. But they they saw that, and they took the challenge, and they got the four runs, scratched them across. I didn't think so. Like, when it, when it went to one nothing that home run, I was like, oh, man, that might be it because this Logan Allen's mowing us down and not even having any resistance. But they showed a little grit, a little heart, a little toughness, and a comeback victory, even though it was only one to nothing. Winning this way 4-2 to two was good. Yeah. And then 2-1, to one, right, too? It, it turned into two. It was one to nothing, one to one, two to one, and then the White Sox got their Correct. their three in their seventh yes. inning. Uh, Romy drove in two on the uh, bases loaded double. Can't trade that man. Um, well, I mean, you know, I I, I don't know about he, the Romy. He looked Gonzalez good today. Thing. I, I got to give him credit. He had one hit and then good. he walked. He looked good. Nice defensive hey, play man. too. <laughs> you got to give right? Romy. You gotta give I'm not him. imagining that he actually walked. Yeah, I think he walked okay. towards the end of the game. Because uh, uh, Beef Loaf shared this earlier. Uh, Romy Gonzalez's last walk was on August 26, 2022. Since that day, he had 135 plate appearances with zero walks and 54 Ks for a 40% K rate. So um, it was bound to happen at some point that Romy Gonzalez was going to walk. So, uh, you know, it just took him a bit there. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. We'll talk about the roster after the break here. Uh, and, and we'll see if Romy's going to be on this roster. We saw the return of Hans or Alberto. Um, maybe Luis Roberts' injury is going to just kind of make things shuffle around a little bit more. Uh, might not be that serious, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, just after the break. Um, real quick, Dylan, uh, I just want to mention his day. Um, we can go to his stuff. Um, six innings, two earned runs, 
uh, five hits allowed, three Ks, two walks. Logan Allen, again, six innings pitch, four earned runs, seven hits, four Ks, one walk. Um, and then Dylan today uh, threw 88 pitches, um, right? Seems wrong. Threw only yeah. 88? Okay. Uh, 88 pitches for Dylan, uh, 41 fastballs, 24 knuckle curves, 21 sliders, two change-ups. Uh, the pitch velocity and, and spin was was normal. Nothing uh, too different for Dylan today. Uh, and then if we can go to the uh, results. Um, is it results, Stephen? Yeah. Look at you. Look at you. Uh, <laughs> the exit velocity is a little scary. 19 mm-hmm. balls in play, uh, 94.3 uh, average exit velocity. But also, you know, Dylan throws hard, so that kind of – it also plays into that. Ooh. But uh, five whiffs today on 40 swings, uh, a 13% whiff rate, uh, 13 called strikes, and a called strike pl- plus whiff percentage of uh, 20%. Um, interesting to see that Dylan relied on the curveball more. Uh, yes. 24 curveballs thrown uh, compared to 21 sliders. Um, uh, Beef Loaf yesterday on the Aju mentioned that uh, – Rick Giolito reached out to him and, and mentioned that uh, Dylan isn't feeling comfortable with the slider, and I think we've uh, James Fegan wrote something similar about that uh, in the Athletic about how you know Dylan's still trying to f- find that confidence. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's you know he just doesn't have that confidence yet, and you know we know how how much of a game changer that pitch is. So um, until Dylan has that, he might you know be laboring through these outings again another outing for dylan Cease where he doesn't have premium stuff and just pitches a pedestrian effort and i don't mean that in a derogatory sense but he get got the job done and to limit him only to the runs that they got is a a good thing and to see that slider was way down and no one's really swinging with it two swings on that not not dylan Cease like and to still get a victory versus the cleveland Guardians team, which has Naylor in the lineup, has Jose Ramirez in the lineup, which the White Sox, I, I, that triple I don't count as an actual hit. It was hit hard, but I think a real right fielder pretty much camps under that and catches it, you know, in his glove. I mean, I don't think uh, Frazier yeah, was I mean, back sir, to the wall. I mean, it's, it was a tough play, but I think a, a premium it, it, right fielder catches it. It's a home it. run in a lot of parks. Right, too. I was yeah. going to say, <laughs> a guaranteed right field, that's probably out. Yeah, yeah probably, but that's I'm saying, bullpen. like, it's not – I'm not going to see. We've held – my point was we've held Jose Ramirez down with our two starters or the opener yesterday, the bullpen today, and then uh, Dylan Cease. But isn't that a, a bad job. process even though the result isn't a home run? I mean, aren't you always about walking Jose Ramirez on every I single am. thing? I am. So if you walked him, he would have been on first, not on third? No, I am. With the base open, I, I'm 100% about walking Jose Ramirez. But uh, I don't know what the situation – it was two outs, right? Yeah. I think it's two outs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know if I walk in there. Well, and yeah, and with, that's after and, Kelly makes and, that play coming off And with off Joe the Kelly, too. Yeah, yeah I don't think uh, – and I think Joe Kelly, I was uh, common to you guys that I think Joe Kelly used that timeout slash injury thing. He might have been a little hurt, but, you know, immediately you threw a pitch and he's like, I'm fine. I think he was using it as like a timeout, just a breather, because he just got off the mound, ran to a ball, threw it with all his might, just uh, catch his own breath, and now a tough hitter in Jose Ramirez. But I think that's – the White Sox have done a good job versus him, and I think that, you know, going forward, Joe Kelly, man, that guy looks like an all-star premium closer. And if we're talking about what we were talking about yesterday, where they might be selling off, which, you know, they're still going to be five and a half games out if the Twins lose today, that guy can fetch you some people because mm-hmm. he looks absolutely unhittable, even though Jose Ramirez took him almost yard. Almost. Yard. But Jose Ramirez is Jose Ramirez. Well, the, and then Naylor actually drove in that run, too. So, right? Not No. no. He got, he got uh, Naylor to end the he inning. He was out. Yeah. Naylor got a hit earlier in the, the game. Time. Yeah. Na- no, Naylor no, had a no. double earlier in the inning, or early in the game, rather, to drive in that second run. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, I, I, Kelly, I, I think he'll be valuable for sure. Um, but, you know, I mean, how much is that going to actually get you in return? It's oh, a reliever, and, you know. Again, I mean, we've got to just keep we've we've got to we've got to wait. We can't talk whether this is going to be a buy or sell situation for the White Sox yet. We don't know because if they're four, three or four games out at the deadline, don't you think they'd rather have Joe Kelly to try and help them win a division? We'll see. We'll see. It's it's a lot. It, it there's a lot has to happen. We're, we're the, throw out throw it out the window. The whole they make up their mind by Memorial Day because the White Sox are playing under special circumstances, <laughs> which is they play in the 2023 American <laughs> League Central. Well, I guess that's different than the 1997 American League Central. I mean, you responded to my uh, my uh, 
tweet earlier, but mm -hmm. I, I, we kind of had the discussion yesterday just about, you know, could they white flag this possibly again? Uh, maybe this isn't the uh, powerhouse that the 1997 Cleveland team is. Um, I, I'm not really sure. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I found it weird that, you know, it was the right, quote unquote, right move to make the trade just because Jerry said that, you know, no, no we're not catching that Cleveland team, even though we're three and a half games back. Um, and then it took three years to win the division. Like that took a long, long time to get the, the fruits of the labor. And then, oh, what happened in 2001? Oh, no, nothing. What happened in 2002? Nothing. What happened in 2003? Uh, Jerry Manuel's gone at that point. Uh, and then, you know, obvious, Ozzie obviously comes back. But, you know, this team has very small, you know, instances of success. So I, I'd be surprised for them to, in the white or in this American League Central, to kind of give up on any chance to make the postseason. Yeah, there's also there's a reason that that trade is looked back upon so often too, right? Because it is not a usual thing mm -mm. that gets done. And I think uh, were that were those circumstances to be uh, to be presented to this White Sox team this year. They're definitely going for it. Full steam There's ahead. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There should be – I mean, they should have been full steam ahead then too, but uh, that Cleveland Indians team at the time was a powerhouse, but they were only three and a half games out. Uh, getting Danny Darwin off the team and Roberto Hernandez and getting the players that got Keith Folk, uh, Bob Howry, and Mike Caruso back, fine, good. Uh, but everybody who was a White Sox fan at the time was furious – and this team is totally different because none of these teams are world beaters. Even the White Sox themselves are not world beaters. So if they're within, I say, within eight games at the trade deadline, I think the White Sox are still eight pushing games. it. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I tend yes. to agree with you, Herb. I yeah. tend to agree with you. Yeah, yeah they're still pushing because it. Because not only, not only does it mean that the White Sox are still kind of close, it means that it's been another two months of the Twins and everybody else failing to pull away. Yeah. yeah. Jerry's also 87 at this point. I mean, he's, he's you know... I mean, just take it. Yeah. But Waiting three more years, not not ideal hey, for anybody. I mean, long life, 90. Uh, anyways, uh, let's take a break. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's take a break. I'll uh, let you know about Shader Ace. Um, I'm much more uh, suited to talk about uh, Shader Ace and sunglasses. Uh, Steven, our producer, was just down in Arizona taking on the sun with his Shady Rays, our friends have you covered with the warm weather head with premium polarized shades at an affordable price. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. They have durable frames and extremely clear optics for outdoor adventure. And that's not all. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection program in all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses backed by lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, it tells us that they will send you a brand new pair. No questions asked. You can wear your Shady Rays with confidence because they have your back long after your purchase. And if you don't love your Shady Rays, you can exchange them for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop. Their team always has your back. And exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal this season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code CHGO for 50% off two plus polarized shades. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 thousand people uh her, herb you drinking a goose island i am drinking a delicious 312 from goose island you're not i'm drinking healthy water but i wish it was a go. goose island um yeah i mean goose island is, is also healthy folks you know i mean yeah. uh, you know it's a it's, it's healthy for the soul uh chgo supported by goose island beer company i'm glad you specified no because otherwise that yeah, you could be you know, you don't want to just lie. I am Dr. Yeah. Anderson. Yeah. Uh, Chicago's beer since <laughs> 1988. Um, is your favorite the 312 Weed Ale? Do you have a, a, a perfect, you know, a, a favorite Goose Island beer? Um, the Hazy Beer Hug. I have the Beer Hug series, the Neon Hazy Tropical. I drink these for the show so I don't uh, get too much and I got to drive home after this. Of course. I mean, this is only know. like a 5.5 or 4.2. Those hazy ones get, you know, started, I think, like mm. 6%. Yeah. They're, they're dangerous. You're not driving home after one of those. This is a uh, dangerously yeah, after, easy yeah, after one of those other ones yeah <laughs> it's gonna be tough you got a fave i love a 312 i one. i have every time i love the reliability any bar you go to in this town mm -hmm. you walk in there and you you say give me a 312 they say okay well and do you know which <laughs> bars specifically have goose island 312 uh the brewery the the goose island brewery um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah, I would they, hope they right. would. Uh, yeah. You can grab an ultra fresh brewery exclusive beer at Goose Island's original t uh, brew house on Clybourne Avenue in Lincoln Park or from their tap room on Fulton Street in Westtown. Goose Island Beer Company, Chicago's beer. You know, I went and to go back to the Shady Race, uh, Reeb, mm -hmm. and Stephen being down in Arizona. When I was in Arizona slash San Diego, I 
asked somebody, I was like, man, this sun is like hotter than it is in uh, Chicago. Because somebody's like, you're close to the sun, idiot. You're close to the equator. I was like, oh, God, yeah, we're close to the sun. I was like, why is it so damn hot? And Steven's uh, glasses held up to that sun. Yeah, actually, I put them in my bag, and it was stuffed in there. I mean, this thing was packed. And I'm thinking, oh, man, maybe not the brightest call, but I accidentally forgot my, my, my other Shady Rays at home. I, I, I got two. Mm-hmm. I wanted, the, I wanted the, the other ones for the golf course because I knew I was going to sweat a lot. And somehow these things held up in that tightly packed bag of mine. And the case, easy it's to tr- clean them. Wipe yeah. the swept right off. It says durable on the review. It's very what a durable. review from Steven. Yeah. I mean, look at that. I mean, make sure that's, that's time stamped and everything. He's also, he also closer to the sun, like just literally. Oh, yeah. Because it's a higher elevation. Yes. Oh, yeah. It is in Arizona. I forgot about that. Well, he's taller than me, too. Yeah, I also well, right, true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got those extra three inches or so. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> Big difference. All right. uh, Vinny and Steven are both, tall, are both taller than us and close to the sun every day. Um, I wanted to be shot into the sun uh, earlier today when I saw oh, this God. quote from uh, Daryl Vance Gowan. Uh, that, <laughs> seems, it, that seems like an overreaction. Is it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what it is. So hey, maybe. Quick, sec, quick, quick uh, tangent. Why don't we shoot all our garbage into the sun? It would be much easier. I don't know. That makes a lot of sense. I think, and you don't have that big thing of plastic out in the ocean. Well, yeah, that that's a good point. But are we worried about the smell, or does space not smell? I think the sun is too powerful to even register a smell. Do you think the people in Arizona would smell that? I mean, more so than us, right? Yeah, probably. (laughs) I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's a great idea. Probably be a little bit of waste of of rockets and such. But or we should just throw it to the moon. There's nothing out there. No, no no. one's living there. Didn't you see the time machine? Are we going to the moon? No. Didn't you see the movie, The Time Machine? No. They send too much stuff to the moon. They build a colony on the moon, and then the moon crumbles and falls to Earth and wrecks I Earth. Hmm. What would we do without spoiler alert for, Spoiler alert for the remake of The Time Machine <laughs> with Guy Pierce, but that happens in that movie. Mm. Oh, I can't wait to watch it. Uh, what, what a selling point. Um, anyways, uh, when we shoot trash into the moon, strap me up. Uh, Dale Vance Gowan, uh, who's out. Uh, covering uh, the team in Cleveland, uh, was at Pedro Grafol's pregame scrum, and Grafol said, uh, taking up the possibil- uh, probability of Jake Berger playing second base. Uh, wait, oh, sorry, I don't know how to read. Grafol talking up the probability probability of Jake Berger playing second base, not as an everyday player, but when it bets suits lineup construction. We saw Jake Berger bat second today. He struggled. Um, he took 14 big healthy hacks tonight, and he swung and missed 10 times. Um, he struck out five. Uh, so he, he had a rough day, but that's a pretty big turn from Jake Berger. I mean, this it's was called, a guy. It's called a 180 from Pedro Grafol is what it's called. I mean, this is a guy spring training we were discussing. Maybe he'll never play third base again. And, you know, Yohan Moncada goes down, and we see him. Put back at third base. He's been all right. He was all right. Um, you know, we, we know that he's been working on first base, but now, now playing second base? I mean, I'm I, I'm surprised. I really am surprised because of the way that Pedro Grafal has been talking about that. He's been asked about that multiple occasions, including by myself uh, on the last homestand, and seem to have absolutely no appetite for that, citing the fact that the new rules that, in, that impacted the shift – mean Jake Berger and, and the range, the, the ground that he's able to cover at second base, you can't help with it, it with the shortstop. You can't move the shortstop over there and kind of make up for that. He called it experimentation at one point. Um, well, and we he, know that Jake Berger practiced at second base a few years ago in the minor leagues, but that's not really a lot, and that's not called having experience at second base. Um, but all of a sudden... Here's Aloy Jimenez coming back from the injured list. Here's Jake Berger having a just a torrid start to the season. Coming in at a night that OPS was almost 1,000. Gavin Sheets has been a consistent hitter. You need to have Moncada in the lineup. You need to have Andrew Vaughn in the lineup. The only way you get all these guys in there is if you do some experimentation, it seems like, and it seems like the White Sox would finally be uh, open to doing that kind of thing, which as of you know two weeks ago, maybe even less, it sounded like they weren't going to try that at all. They hadn't discussed it at all, according to Pedro Grafol. And now here, Jake Berger is taking ground balls at second base. Well, and even the, the shift thing that you bring up, I think he compared it to Mike Moustakis, no? 
Or? Well, he was asked about Mike Moustakas, who was not only one of his former charges in Kansas City, but a guy who went from being a regular third baseman to being, I believe it took until he went to Milwaukee, mm-hmm. to be moved over to play some second base. He was, he, that comparison was made by another reporter, and the idea was Moustakas had the benefit of having help from the shortstop who could line up on the other side of the second base bag. I am not a fan of that. I hope it doesn't happen. Um, and today you saw why Jake Berger doesn't get regular bets because he looked just lost. Um, he needs regular bets at home because he's a different player from home to away. And we had eye pitch uh, apparently out there in Cleveland, so there's no excuse there. I don't know what's, you know, what's the ma- main difference between the home games and the road games, but for home games, I got to have Jake Berger in the lineup, but not at second base. I think that's way too much risk because we're already playing a first baseman out in right field. If Gavin Sheets is out there, we're just having a bunch of playing a DH out in right field. If Aloy's out there, yeah, you just have a bunch of players that are out of position. And today, late in the game, I know they didn't have Hazley to go to when Robert got hurt. You're playing Romy Gonzalez out in center field. There's a lot of this going on with the White Sox. And I know it's out of necessity because of injuries, roster construction, all those things. But the last thing I want to see is Jake Berger at second base because I don't think he can cover second base. Hell, he can't cover third base adequately. You know, you say that all the time. I said he's been fine this year. You're like, nah, he's like a negative one outs above replacement. I mean, I don't I don't care that much. I mean, you just you you've been way too uh, you know, bullish on him. And I, I'm was, just trying he's to fine. bring you back down to reality. He's fine. No, last year he was a butcher at third. This year, fine. He go he's he's fine. That's what I'll put on him. And <laughs> at second base, no. Like, you could do that with Elvis Andres because he's uh, used to the middle of the infield type of stuff. Shortstop to second base, apparently not that hard, so he doesn't look like it's a, a huge departure. I think Jake Berger would look absolutely horrid at second base, letting a lot of balls go through that would be a regular second base mode to pick up routinely. Well, and I think it's important to note this doesn't sound like it's going to be a everyday thing. Very, It might be used very sparingly and perhaps only until – uh, and not even regularly, but only until Elvis Andrews comes back mm-hmm. from the injured list, which apparently is not too far off either. They might, you might have a rehab assignment coming for him next week. Aloy Jimenez, I don't know if we mentioned the detail on this show, but um, James Fegan and everybody else who are, down, uh, who are out there in Cleveland, uh, Aloy Jimenez left for his rehab assignment today, three or four days with AA Birmingham, it sounds like, uh, from the, the word they got from Pedro Grafol. So he could be back by the start of the homestand on Monday, perhaps. So um, you're going to see a lot more Aloy in right field. Uh, again, not on a daily basis, but I, I believe Pedro said enough to to help them kind of construct a lineup. And here we go. They're getting this puzzle where they've got to try to fit all these bats in there at once. It is uh, a good problem to have indeed, but to you, to that's a Rick Hahn quote that he's mentioned many, many times. To go back to Rick Hahn, what was the one of the main things that he wanted to achieve this offseason, making mm-hmm. this team better defensively? He did that in the outfield with Benintendi and Oscar Colas, but after one month, Oscar Colas gets sent back to the minor leagues, at, you know, which is part of the reason that this puzzle is even doable because there's a quote unquote opening in right field. But and then uh, you know you're going to play Jake Berger at second base. You're going to you know I'm, there's a lot of lessening of that defensive um, progress that they made. But hey. This team's ten games under five hundred. <laughs> they got to do something to. They got to do something to turn this around. And if you're going to sacrifice defense for offense, you're looking at how last year was supposed to look, which was, hey, we know the White Sox. We know that Andrew Vaughn is not this defensive champion out in the right out in right field. We know that Gavin Sheets is not this guy that should that is going to be winning any gold gloves in the corner outfield. But look at what those guys can do with their bats. Yasmani Grandal behind the plate, maybe it's not what it used to be for him, but look at what he can do with his bat. Tim Anderson is going to make some errors at shortstop, but look at what he can do with his bat. That didn't materialize because those guys didn't hit the way they were supposed to. You're getting some guys hitting now. The the offensive situation the White Sox are in right now is better, I would argue, than the offensive situation they were in last year. When you've got Jake Berger hitting, when you've got Aloy hitting, when you've got Moncada hitting, when you've got Gavin Sheets hitting, Andrew Vaughn has not joined that club quite yet because he's in a bit of a slump right now, but he had a good April. 
they are seeing the idea of the offense will cover up the mistakes being made by the defense. And to their credit, I think with the exception of one or two not- notable, uh, memorable moments out there, Gavin Sheets has been fine in right field. Some plays that he's not making that other guys would make probably, but not like he's out there dropping the ball all over the place. And, of course, I was going to say not like he's out there falling down and tripping over his own feet, but <laughs> he did do that one time. No offense to Gavin. That did seem like a one-off thing. But, uh, yeah, I, I think they're seeing in their minds right now, hey, we got to make up some ground, and we have an opportunity to make up some ground. Let's push the bats. Let's get the guys hitting. If we can get this lineup cooking, then the defense is not going to lose them games perhaps. But when you put a guy like Jake Berger at second base who's never played there before, if on the same day he's got Aloy Jimenez in right field, which is a guy who we've had this conversation a million times, has had plenty of negative moments in the outfield, Andrew Vaughn's over at first base, and maybe Sheets is DHing. It's it's not a great defensive lineup. I I don't think anybody would argue it would. And certainly, then, if there's anything that causes Luis Robert Jr. to miss any time in center field, then that compounds things all the more. You're not going to start Adam Hazley in uh, in in right. I mean, I guess he would play center. But my point being, you're not going to put a defensive specialist in right field if Luis can't play center just to cover ground because then your lineup is sapped. But this is the balance that they've got to figure out, and this is the puzzle that Pedro has to put together. It's not exactly an enviable position to be in. And we'll see what happens um, tomorrow in center field, uh, but it doesn't seem too severe with Luis Robert Jr. to update Kevin and Bob. Uh, Pedro said post game. this is from James Fegan, uh, Luis Robert has some soreness in his hip slash quad and won't play tomorrow uh, like we kind of uh, speculated, but downplayed the severity, said he's truly day to day. So we'll see who the center field is tomorrow, but uh, you know, Luis Robert should be able to play on Thursday. Um, so to talk a little bit about the active roster, then uh, Yasmani and Sebi will obviously stay the catchers. Uh, Tim Anderson's not going anywhere. Jake Berger is obviously not going anywhere. And this is when Aloy Jimenez comes back. Uh, Yoan and Andrew Vaughn aren't going anywhere. Ben Attendi, Romy, Hazley, Luis Robert Jr., and then Gavin Sheets. Um, is it just Clint Frazier is is off the, the active roster and, and Aloy Jimenez gets activated once he's done with his rehab assignment? It seemed that way to me only because now now Clint Frazier has started two of the three games that he's been active during, mm-hmm. so perhaps a chance to show what he can do there. But uh, Pedro seems to be able to use Adam Hazley in a variety of ways. He uses him as a defensive replacement, uses him as a pinch runner often, and is confident enough should he sub him in late in the game for one of those two purposes to send him up to the plate. Billy Hamilton seemed to be, when he was on the active roster, he's still on the IL, seemed to be more just go out there and be a pinch runner kind of. I think Hazley has a little bit more that Pedro was comfortable letting him do. It would seem to me that Frazier might be the odd man out just because, and I know you know a lot of people might scoff, but I don't think they want to lose Hazley because of the way that they're able to deploy him. And Hazley's left-handed, so that's probably another factor into him playing more and being on this team more than uh, Frazier. I think Frazier can only be like a corner outfielder. Hazley can cover all three of the spots out there in uh, in the outfield. And like uh, Vinny said, pinch runner, even though we saw Clint Frazier with a stolen base today. Sweet. Yeah, I, I mean, I, Justin saying Frazier looked like a major league ball player today. I mean, he he got a fastball right down the middle and hit the hell out of it, which is, which is yeah. good. Um, <laughs> it's a very, very rare thing to see on the White Sox. Yeah, right. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm ready to say, you know, Clint Frazier – uh, is is, is going to be long for this team. I'm rooting for him. Though. He might be better than Hazley. I don't know if um, today boy is is wrong or not. Um, but uh, I, I could see, you know, maybe Clint Frazier surviving it and Hazley going down if they do like Frazier's speed. Uh, both guys do have uh, one option left. Um, so so we'll see how the, the, those those cards fall. Guys, uh, guys, just lost in the shuffle. I mean, what happens to Oscar Colas? Is is there a path back to the majors for him in the yeah. immediate future? Ah, uh, I think it's so. a good question. Yeah, I mean, it is a good question because I think again, it it's not he he won a job in spring training, and now it's where do you put him? I mean, I I, I think then it was you're the right fielder, and now it's do we have a spot to put him? He's been tearing it up in AAA. Um, 
I think that they, the way, the way that Pedro and Chris Getz talked about him on the last homestand, talked about Colas on the last homestand, it seemed to be there's some stuff they want him to work on. And the what what we all see in the stat sheet where it's like, all right, he's got it figured out. He, he's, he's back to being Oscar Colas, might not tell the whole story. And if they're seeing him have, res, have great results, but as to, to the point that Herb always brings up, it's not necessarily the product of the ideal at bat that they want to see. They'd rather him stay down there and, and figure it out a little more. Again, it's odd to say that after they saw enough from him a last year when they after, because they were talking about him as the starting right fielder as early as November, but B in spring they were like, all right, he's ready for an everyday job in the spring. But here they are now talking about some things that they want to see from him developmentally. And something too in the 15 games that he's played since going down to Charlotte, uh, obviously the numbers have been great. Uh, you know, uh, 10 extra base hits on 21 hits, uh, 339 batting average, 400 OBP, 532 slugging. Uh, 15 games. Seven of them have been in center. Five of them have been in right field. So uh, I don't know if that's that's something they're working on too. It's just the defense and the the flexibility there. Um, but it, once Aloy's on this team, Herb, what does the defense look like? I mean, against a, a left hander today. I mean, how would you roll it out? Tim obviously at, at shortstop, Yohan at third, Yasmani mm-hmm. at catcher. But I mean, how how would you go around the diamond to? to lay it out and get Aloy and Jake Berger and all the bats needed in, in the lineup. Well, Berger would be my DH there, of course, Vaughn's at first. And then, yeah, I would have uh, Aloy because he has played outfield, and I don't think he's a butcher in the outfield, just gets hurt out there. So he would be my right fielder. Benintendi, of course, left, and then uh, Luis Robert at center field. I would do that versus a left-hander. And f- for at home versus a right-hander, I would have to force – Jake Berger into the lineup, but still have Gavin Sheets in the lineup somehow. So if Andrew Vaughn is not getting his bat right, those at bats might have to go to either Jake Berger or Gavin Sheets because you just can't have a middle of the order guy that's just not driving the ball, not hitting at all right now. So I would think about having a little tune at first base, especially at home, because you have to have Jake Berger play home games because he's just so great there. I mean, it's tough. I don't see them taking Andrew Vaughn off first base for anything more than the occasional blow. Um, you know, they, they might play him a DH, but mm-hmm. I, I, I don't see them taking him out of the lineup uh, for anything more than, you know, a rest day here and there. And we just heard from Pedro in regards to Tim Anderson that the White Sox don't like to, or this iteration of the White Sox, I should say, don't like to sit guys down when they're just slumping at the plate. So I, I see Andrew Vaughn continuing to get regular at-bats all the way, just like I do with Tim Anderson. Um, I, If I'm the manager, I and there's a very good reason that why I'm not, so I'm not using this as criticism, but uh, I, I, wouldn't, I would be hesitant to play people at positions that they don't play. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, this is a quote-unquote good problem to have, but it's still a problem, well, and, and, and I don't. I, I wouldn't put Jake Berger at second base because he has no experience playing second base. But how many times did I say that during the off, uh, the winter when it came to Elvis Andrews and look what the White Sox did? They went out and got Elvis Andrews to be their second baseman. But Jake Berger's been in this organization for a long while. Jake Berger has shown pop at the major league level the three years he's been here. And he didn't make the opening day roster even though they knew it, how he could hit. And they weren't trying him at second base then either. No. Like, I mean, so... He's forced the issue. I mean, give he, the guy credit. He's forced the issue. But. but is he forced the issue enough to the point where he's playing completely out of position? I mean, haven't they learned their lesson? No. That's just the history of the damn White Sox. I mean, like, it's 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 just the same thing I hope over and over it's again. It's just like, Pedro having an open mind and and putting that out in the atmosphere. An open but mind to a bad idea? But Yes, but also knowing, like he told the reporters and Vinny, in Chicago numerous times, no, no, we're not doing that. I hope that's driving his uh, thought process. Like, yeah, I'll have an open mind and think about doing that, but no, when it comes time for him to actually do that, no. If you want to do that in a pinch hit situation, pinch hit him from Romy or for Elvis Andres, God bless. But subsequent inning, the other guy better be in there at second base because I think it's going to be a disaster if he plays second base. The alternatives, though, just keep in mind what the alternatives are which are offensive nights like the last two nights. And I know that doesn't 
make a lot of sense considering Jake Berger was in the lineup the last two nights. But the point being that it, they might see their path back to to this season meaning something for them as score a bunch of runs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, we'll, and we'll take the defensive miscues as they come. If they've hit yeah. enough home runs over the past, you know, 20, I think they've had more home runs or, than games uh, since the comeback against the Rays, uh, you know, to end April. Um, and, you know, they continued that with Yaz. So, I mean, clearly, you know, home runs have led to wins. I think they're 13-9 and nine, uh, over that stretch. So, I mean, you know, it, that's ball, go far, team go far. Rick Hahn obviously, you know, labeled that. But, again, it's just frustrating that it's it's at the the sake of their defense, uh, you know. And, and having a loy out in right field and Jake Berger at second base, um, maybe it's only one game, but, yikes, I'll be holding my breath that entire game. Uh, hopefully, just left-handers come up yeah, like, yeah. son of a bitch. How about, well, how about that, how about that, pop, how about that pop up into oh shallow Jesus. right field? Oh, my God. <laughs> Andrew Vaughn, see Jake Andrew Berger, happy. and Aloy Jimenez all converge on a ball, mm-hmm. and Luis Roberts running as fast yeah. as he can to get to it. Maybe all three of them end up on the ground like, <laughs> like Andrew Vaughn did. And Luis Roberts, the bowling ball, and the pins. <laughs> <laughs> Knocking them all down. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. Uh, Michael Kopech has a big, 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 important start for the Sox to try to close out this series with a win. Do I have my ComEd readers, though? Because it will be uh, Michael Kopech. Uh, <laughs> got to clear that throat for our acting performance. Herb. Oh, but It'll be uh, Michael Kopech versus uh, Cleveland Guardian starter Cal Quantrill. Uh, when you guys are ready, please take it away. The ComEd Energy Efficiency Program is committed to helping families and businesses in the communities they serve, helping manage energy usage and lower energy bills. Now and into the future, Vinny. Yes, Herb, you're correct. I am. ComEd offers a wide variety of incentives on lighting and other efficiency upgrades to commercial, industrial, and public sector public sector customers of all sizes across our beloved territory. ComEd also offers free facility assessments that can help find energy-saving opportunities, like for HVAC systems, commercial kitchen equipment, or industrial processes. Hmm. How does that work, Vinny? I'm happy you asked, and I'm glad to tell you. An authorized engineer will work with you to develop a detailed assessment plan specific to your goals and needs. These can be done in person or virtually and last approximately two hours. Within three to four weeks, customers will receive a report detailing energy efficiency projects that they can start working on immediately. Each recommendation will include estimated energy savings, cost savings, project cost, potential incentives, and simple payback. If you, yes you, own a business, don't wait. And here's a little behind the scenes. There's a thing here called the CTA, which is announced. We all know that as, of course, the Chicago Transit Authority. That was what Chicago was called initially. Yeah, the band, yes, the band, you're absolutely yeah. correct. Get started saving money and energy today. For energy saving tips, lighting incentives, or to schedule your free facility assessment, go to comed.com slash powering biz spelled B I Z. Did you say comed.com slash powering biz spelled B I Z? Indeed, I did, Herb. Schedule it today. And that CTA for the kids at home? Call to action. Thank you. Acting! Great job. Um, <laughs> also want to let you fans know about uh, the Die Hard program. Uh, we got the box right here. Uh, comes with a ton of goodies. When you sign up, uh, you get a free t-shirt. You also get access to the members-only Discord that we have where you get to chat with all of us CHGO personalities. Um, you also get uh, a membership card and I believe a, a sticker pack as well when you sign up. But what we're trying to do here at CHGO is basically, you know, Make it fun to be a, a White Sox fan. Obviously, they're 10 games under 500, but we're trying to inform you, trying to make it entertaining to follow this White Sox team, whether they're 20 and 30, 30 and 20, 50 and 0, um, right? You know, it's going to be a lot. They uh, will not be 50 and 0 at any point this season. N- I, this I, season. I, I, I hate to inform you, right? No, but, but, but in a future season, and probably not. And you, as a diehard, will be following uh, when, when the White Sox eventually go 50 uh, and 0. Uh, but, anyways, make sure you go over to allchgo.com and become a diehard. You do get a free shirt when you sign up. Uh, we got some uh, lovely ones uh, that are brand new, like the, uh, the North Side, South, South Side one. Uh, those are really cool designs. We got the Cy Cease one. Uh, he just pitched well today. Uh, so, go check out uh, all the dope merch over at chgolocker.com. And uh, if you do want to become a diehard, sign up at allchgo. Dot com, But, it, I mean, come on. We got podcasts and live shows on every team, every single day. There's not a lot of podcasts and even post-game shows for the White Sox that have an active beat writer, an active beat member 
uh, contributing to the show every damn night. I mean, that's pretty cool. And Vinny, out of all the CHGO members, just a little brag here, uh, he joins the earliest out of all the beat writers. Huh. You know, I do what? You out of the, uh, for, for the show, out of all the beats, yeah. you join the earliest. In the program. You're the oh, most prompt okay, beat writer. Gotcha. By about it's 20 minutes, much, too. Wow. It's yeah. probably like 25 minutes of the show every time. It's pretty much by, on clockwork. Sean's like, once I finish this read, Vinny will join us. Boom, Vinny. All right. So shout out to you. You're always prompt. Oh, um, thanks, guys. So go follow Vinny on Twitter, at Vinny Duber. But, uh, yeah, not you like know, that Ryan over there, that Ryan Herrera. <laughs> Cubs guys. Ugh. No, I'm kidding. I'll just, I'll just say this. You know, I mean, the, the, the people that do the TV postgame show, they've been doing it for a very, very long time. Very, very good, uh, you know, former colleagues of Vinny Duber. But uh, that network, do they, do they have a current beat writer for the White Sox? So I'm just saying, like, you are getting the most in-depth knowledge, I think, for a White Sox postgame show here. That's just my thought. Anyways, uh, become a diehard today. Sean always pissing on NBC Sports. I'm Chicago. not trying to. I, I, I don't talk of, I don't <laughs> hype us out a ton. So I'm just trying to take. I got you. Garfine, Garfine's going to gonna be waiting for me in the alley oh, when we walk out here tonight. He's going to be sharks and jets. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, final thought on the, the roster today, Jake Berger, just Logan Allen. Uh, Logan Allen. Out of swing percentage or out of the zone swing percentage, forty five percent. White Sox lead the league, thirty six point four percent. Yes, I still. mean I'm sure they led by a healthy margin after April, but even still, they yeah. still do too. One point four percent lead over the Phillies um, and Cleveland. Uh, weirdly enough, uh, out of their zone, out of swings, out of the zone swing percent, uh, very high as well, uh, third in the league, um, but still two f- full percentage points less than the White Sox, uh, but they continued that trend today. So just ugly stuff, but they were able to win, which is the most important thing in this game. All right, let's get to tomorrow. Michael Kopech on the bump for the Sox. Fantastic game in his last outing. Eight innings of nearly perfect baseball, 98 pitches. And Herb, you kind of talked about the the, the rest. And uh, Vinny, you brought up that that was kind of typical for him last year, the the six days of rest. Um do we expect that to be in Michael Kopech's future if he doesn't pitch well tomorrow? I mean, how much can they actually um, get rest for Michael Kopech? Can this be a, a more consistent thing? I don't think so. It's just a one-off. You know, you can't just cater a thing to Michael Kopech to have him pitch on extended rest and have everybody else have to speed up their uh, pitching performances and go on early uh, performances. So, yes, he statistically pitches better when he gets an extra day or two of rest. But you, he's going to have to find a way to pitch on regular days rest. And then tomorrow, like I point out to you guys, it's an early game. So it's earlier. So he'll get fewer amounts of rest than he usually would because he pitched a, a Friday night game. Now he's pitching a Wednesday afternoon game. Um, I think the guy probably saw his uh, performance last time he went out there and said, I can repeat this. I can do this again, no matter who's out there. Because this Cleveland team we saw today and yesterday, they're not hitting. And Michael Kopech's, I think, main bugaboo is walks. And last game, I know people were impressed with the almost no-hit perfect game type of stuff. but And the 10 strikeouts, the zero walks was the thing I saw. And I was like, there we go. That's what Michael Kopech does when he's actually feeling it. He was pitching that last start, and I think he can repeat that performance versus these Cleveland Guardians because they're not that tough. And Cal, Cal Contra on the other side, not that tough himself. So I don't think the uh, I think the White Sox will help him with a couple runs early in that game so he can calm down and get into his roof. Twenty five starts for Michael Kopech in twenty twenty two, all but nine of them came on more than four days rest, which is the, the normal four, four days rest. I don't think we're going to see that become another trend again in 2023, mostly because they, they, they don't really have uh, the ability to do that very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would have to play with basically every off day on the schedule and hope that it works out mm-hmm. in which that would, that would uh, turn into a thing again. They were trying to bring him back to the life of a starting pitcher last year. They did that. I don't think that you're seeing things with Michael Kopech in terms of his physical ability when it comes to him getting regular rest during a, a baseball season, at least through the first month or month or two here. I don't think we've seen problems in that area. Um, but he had 
one more extra day, last time out, and he threw the best game of his career far and away. Uh, again, it's just going to be consistency and, and being able to do not that, but channel that guy mm -hmm. on a regular basis. I, I think Michael Kopech badly wants to be a guy who can take the ball every five days. I don't think he wants to be somebody who has to be moved around and can only be used under certain circumstances. He wants to be that guy who can deliver every time out. This is that was a great step toward being that guy. You showed you can do it, right? There, and and so now it just comes down to repeating, to doing it on a consistent basis. You don't have to throw eight perfect innings every single time, but you have to be that guy who went out there more often than not, and not the guy who Sean. You keep bringing it up, even in a game your team wins by more than a dozen runs, you're out there giving up home runs and having problems. So I I, I think that that. That, that last outing for Michael Kopech can only be a good thing for him, but just like they always say in baseball, momentum is only as good as, as, the, as the next starting pitcher. Mm -hmm. For him, it's only as good as his next start. Well, and you know what's great for the White Sox? Michael Conforto going two for four, and the Giants leading 4-3 over the Twins. So it's you know possible they might be 5-4. Uh, did he hit a home run? He did hit a home did run. He really? His yes, tenth he did. of the tenth season. Tenth of the season. Oh, God. Let's go. I didn't want to say it because All I knew right. you were going to, and you got to do a tweet too. So yeah, I'll figure it out. Later that's on. A, that's not the most important thing. I'm hosting a show. <laughs> hey, um, let's hey. Andrew Benintendi went 10, got his 10 game hitting streak today. Oh, wow. Would you rather have 10 uh, straight games of the hit or 10 home runs? I mean, he had a nice double Both. today. What are, you, what are you killing <laughs> Andrew I, Benintendi I, for? I, I, do, I do it on Stop. purpose to Jesus make Christ. him mad. And then I, I know Conforto is his guy, so I like this banter. Banter, banter, banter. Okay, I, again. Mac Miller. Uh, Andrew Benintendi did his family a great thing. This man turned his, his, uh, his skills into a $75 million contract. That is incredible for him. I am not trying to bash him. He's a very skilled baseball player. He has been a major league baseball player for eight plus years. All I'm trying to point out is that, yes, he's got a 10-game hit streak, and his uh, career numbers are uh, better than his season averages so far. So he's just been underperforming. Okay, he, that's all. He's fine. He's not the reason the White Sox are 10 games under 500, and I'm sorry if that's what you think that this show is about. I don't care to make it that point, and we'll, we'll get off of it. I'll I find a it. new slant, Vinny. I'm sorry. Steve, no, Steven, I, I wish it. there was a – I wish he had an ISO camera on me because I don't think people can see my eyes rolling into the back of my head from, from the wide shot. <laughs> it could be arranged, Vinny. Yeah. Just say I, I, I always talk about how no, the White Sox are I, 10 games under 500 because they signed Andrew Benatendi, and that's the only reason why. No, I like this. I like your ongoing Benatendi hate. It's fine. It's, yeah, but it's uh, and but it's again, not like, on the actual the guy. It's, it's not, on the it's, other the, the the general manager. And I that's got what it. I feel like it's lost. Yes, it's, it's on Rick Hahn. Yes. I don't care. You don't what do his a good enough. You don't do a good enough job of of making that clear, though. <laughs> well, help me out. I just love you're just it. you're just crushing the poor guy. It is funny. It's funny. I love it. The rich Rick guy Hahn I said, say. "Ball go far, team go far," and he signed a guy who can't hit a damn home run. Why is that Andrew Benintendi's fault? It's not. It's Rick Hahn's fault. He okay. had the, the ability to sign the check, and he wrote to Andrew Benatendi. You need he should have wrote Michael Conforto. You need to specify that no. on a more regular Every basis. Every year, I want some Sean like bugaboo that in the offseason he called the Carlos Rodon thing last year. Oh yeah, he, that was something. Yeah, uh, he did and, that and every what, day. Was last Sean year wrong? Too, yeah. No. And this year is Sean wrong? Oh, it's always I, a, it's I, always the San Francisco Giant too, isn't it? <laughs> I love so which San Francisco you're Giant. You're gonna have to stick now in order to stick to this bit. In order to stick to this bit, <laughs> just you're just gonna have to pick somebody that the Giants signed this offseason, even if they're no good. <laughs> that's well, yeah, but that's like, that's most of the Giants signings. They're they're kind of trash, and maybe they're all right. Um, speaking of Carlos Rodon, I just I did I liked how this was uh, this was worded. Uh, Carlos Rodon said he hopes to throw off the mound soon. Still Ooh. no indication of when he may actually start a rehab assignment, Ooh. but it'll likely be t uh, some time. And uh, Robert Orr, uh, who I think writes for Baseball Perspective, uh, said, I told my fiance I hope to clean the apartment soon. Still no indication <laughs> of when I may actually start, but it'll likely be some time. Um, uh. Going back to Michael Kopech, though, not to get too far off, uh, he, he has been fine, though. It, it, like, not to wave the you know red flags or anything. Career numbers for Michael Kopech uh, on four-day start, uh, on, on four days rest, when he's starting a game, and had 15 uh, games like that, uh, a 5.51 ERA. Uh, five days of rest, Great. starting a game, 15 game start, a 2.87 mm -hmm. ERA. 
six plus days when starting a game, a 359 ERA. So he's been better on five days than getting that extra day. And last year, um, in games when he had five days of rest, a 243 ERA, when he had six plus days in those six starts, a 354 ERA. So there you um, go. There's he, the solution. He was pretty consistent. The White Sox just need a six man rotation. <laughs> and uh, no, Lance, but he was fine on a Lance five Lance like, fuck off. Five <laughs> days is six men. Six, yeah. yeah. Four uh, days is yeah. normal. Yeah, Lance Lynn, like, fuck off. You're not skipping me for another uh, <laughs> They uh, need a five-and-a-half-man yeah, rotation yeah. because Lance, Lance Lynn's pitching every f- five days regardless. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, starting pitchers can really make themselves more useful. Like, if someone could just, like, pitch, like, an extra inning, like, you know, oh, Lance just went six, but then he could also throw one more tomorrow, I mean, that would really increase value. I don't know if that's a possible <laughs> a possibility, but, I mean, you, Shohei Otani showed anything is possible. Um, all right, anything else we got to talk about? No, I think we covered most of the stuff. I mean, Sean is essentially saying he's mad at his dog because it doesn't have wings. That's a good. That's a good point. What KPW with a good line? No, good I, line. I, just I feel like that. I'm not being this illogical. I want my team to hit home runs. The GM said the team is better when they hit home runs. Let's go sign a guy who doesn't hit home runs. I feel like it. To be fair, I want my dog to get to be healthier. I'm not. I'm. We should take him to a vet. I'm not going to take him to a vet. I, I think you want your dog to be a parrot by this. By yes, this, uh, if said. we're sticking with this metaphor. To yes. be fair to I'm Sean, confused. I was like, if whatever outfield they sign, I'm be fine with the four that we put up there. Sean said, I'm fine with anybody besides Andrew Benintendi yes. before the White Sox signed him. So to be fair to Sean, he was not a Benny fan, and he knew that Benny wouldn't provide the home run power. Now, I'm not going to be a Benny fan if that some bitch don't hit 10 home runs this year because it's going to cost me something. What did we bet? I don't know. Was it $100? I hope it's $100. Oh, did you bet $100? No, I won't bet $100 now. <laughs> now, now <laughs> if he, if he gets Steven, on the streak you- and starts hitting home runs, but like, yeah, 100 Do you Sounds remember great. when Herb bet me $100 <laughs> that Andrew Benintendi would hit on, uh, 10 home runs this year? I, I remember the you guys were talking about that on the show. I don't yeah. remember what we ended up deciding. I think he, I think it was a hundred dollars. Steven 100? seems to remember it being a thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Damn. <laughs> I think you said you give me I'm part right. of it. Herb. <laughs> you, you actually, I heard uh, you, that you're actually going to give me a uh, seventy-five million dollars if he doesn't hit ten home runs. Um, you need to do some fundraising there, Herb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good luck. Go to Andy next year when he starts making real money. Tell him to help me out. Better start now. The season ends around October. Um, anyways, uh, that's going to do it for today's post game show. We will be joining you tomorrow after the. Uh, Guardians and Sox wrap up their series and on Thursday we'll have a pre and post game show for you as well so a lot more coming your way on the CHGO Sports YouTube channel make sure you are subscribing to the channel hitting the thumbs up button and hitting that notifications uh, bell so you know when we go live whether that be for the CHGO Bulls Blackhawks Sky Red Stars Fire White Sox Cubs show that's coming later uh, make sure Bears. you hit Bears yeah. uh, make sure you're hitting Bears. that notification Bears. bell Bears uh, make sure you're hitting that notification bell so you're notified when we go live. Make Bears. sure you hit that thumbs up button too. Uh, 28. Who's 28? Larry Garcia. Larry. Oh, the legend. Say, you, man, Lee's and you can forget about him. Hey, you know, I have, I have the memory of a right goldfish. Um, who had a, who has hit a home run more recently, Larry Garcia or Andrew Benatendi? Larry Gar- Well, oh, for White Sox, Larry Garcia. Well, obviously, oh, no. Yes, but, I mean, probably Benatendi, right? He was on the Yankees at the end of last season. We have, yeah. but no, but he, but he got injured at the end of the year. Yeah, well, so did Leary hit a home, home run, run at the end of last season? Though he could barely run. Let's see. Mm-hmm. All right, last home run Leary Garcia hit in a White Sox uniform or just in a major league uniform, July twenty fourth. Andrew Benatendi's last home run. See, that's pr- that's before the all, that's before the trade deadline even. So he must have hit one with the Yankees. Yeah, what you're he hit a, I don't know. Oh yeah, he did yeah. hit one with the Yankees. One hundred percent. All right, last I know that. last one that he hit. Oh yeah, he he hit one in the second game. Yeah. He so the Yankees in his first three games got two home runs. Could you imagine Short right porch. two home runs and three? I mean, Twitter mentions would be a flame if yeah. Andrew Benintendi. You'd have to. Hit, you'd have to quit. You'd have oh, to quit. It's to move states. When <laughs> Andrew Benintendi hits his multiple home run game. I'm going to be tweeting up a storm, and I'll come on this show saying, I told you so. Look at that power from Benny. Uh, August 30th was Andrew Benintendi's last number. There you go. He's due. The, the so, Los Angeles Angels. Oh, he's been due. He's due. Let's he's go. Been due. Uh, thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us. Uh, we're still at Leary Legend Like, so make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button on your way out. We can go to uh, Keith Folks. All the way come back. He's 34? He was 29. Okay. Good job, Herb. 
Uh, that's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at Ackerwell23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. That's Vinny Duber. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. And I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to Stephen Nicholas for producing the show. Welcome back from Arizona. We'll talk to you tomorrow after the White Sox hopefully beat the Guardians uh, and win that series. Go Sox.